This MathBook has been damaged. It actually has some really mysterious marks. Let me just zoom in here so you can see it. Let's wait for the camera to come into focus so you can see them. And they're right there. You see those little dots? Puncture wounds. And there's two more up here. So I don't know what caused that. But if I open the book, you can see them here as well. Really mysterious. It's really always bothered me. And I've always wondered what caused that. In any case, this book is pretty famous. It's called Mathematical Analysis, and it was written by Tom Apostle. And so in this video, we're going to do two things. First, I'm going to go through the book, and I'm just going to go through the contents and show you some of the math in this book. Then we're actually going to do a problem. And so I've picked something that's like further in the book. You know, it's like way deeper in the book. It's not a proof. It's just uh, an explanation. So if you have a better explanation than the one I give, please leave a comment in the comment section because that always helps other people. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the inside of this book. Mathematical Analysis, A Modern Approach to Advanced Calculus. It was written by Tom M. Apostle, Department of Mathematics, California Institute of Technology. That's a really good school. By the way, Apostle has also written other books. In particular, his calculus book, is extremely popular and famous, and also, unfortunately, quite expensive. Copyright 1957, and this is the fourth printing, 1964. I don't know how expensive this book is, by the way. I think it costs less than his calculus books, so I will look for it, and I will try to leave uh, a link in the description. Let's look at the preface. A glance at the table of contents will reveal that most of the topics which usually fall under the heading Advanced Calculus are treated in this book. The author's aim has been to provide a development of the subject matter which is honest, rigorous, up-to-date, and at the same time, not too pedantic. I have read portions of this book. In particular, I've looked at the section on infinite products and uh, some other stuff with double sums, and I thought it was very rigorous. It's definitely not uh, an easy book to read. It takes a lot of effort. You know, it takes some time to get through the pages of this book. So here are the contents, real and complex number systems. It's kind of like Rudin's book, but I like it better and it's definitely thicker. I gotta give it a whiff, let me just... Ah, oh, yeah, so nice. Basic notions of set theory, elements of point set theory. Let's turn the page. The limit concept and continuity. So just basic advanced calculus stuff, but he's very rigorous in his like, treatment. So everything is proven. And there are a lot of like logical leaps that you have to fill in. And that's actually what we're going to do in this video, right? In the example I do, I'm going to try to basically fill in the gaps on one little sentence that he provides. And you'll see, at least in my explanation, it takes some time to go through. Vector analysis, cool. Chapter 12 is on infinite series and infinite products. And then 13 is on sequences of functions. 14 is on some integrals, 15 is on Fourier series and Fourier integrals, and then 16 is on Cauchy's theorem and the residue calculus. So this has a lot of topics that you won't find in other advanced calculus books. So I really think it's super comprehensive. And honestly, it is thick, but for the amount of material it contains, it's pretty. It's a pretty small book. And I think that is um, evident when you actually try to read this book because it's very, very terse. Chapter four is on the limit concept and continuity. Let's read this together. The definition of limit. The reader is already familiar with the notion of limit as introduced in elementary calculus, where in fact, several kinds of limits are usually presented. For example, we have the idea of limit of a sequence, which describes what we write symbolically in the form. So here it says the limit of X sub N, that's your sequence as n approaches infinity is equal to a. There is also the limit of a function indicated by notation such as, and then here they talk about two dimensional limits. Here are the exercises for this section. Let's just take a look at these. So we have to compute some limits here. Those look pretty easy, not too bad. So we've got some easier problems. And these are just typical problems that you would see in an advanced calculus class. Let's turn the page, see what else we got. And they usually get harder, as you can see. And some of these problems can be extremely challenging. You know, typically that's the case with most advanced calculus books. You know, they start off with some simple problems 
and then the problems, they get harder and harder and harder. I've actually done some of these problems on my YouTube channel, which is really weird. So I have videos for some of these exercises. Here he introduces infinite products, and this is really interesting because he does this in a much more rigorous way than, say, Andrews does in his book on special functions. I recently did a video on his book, and I talked a little bit about infinite products, and the way that Andrews uh, defines convergence is very, very different from the way that Apostle does. Apostle does it in a much more rigorous way and takes into account more cases, which makes sense, right? This is an advanced calculus book. Here it talks about double series. So this gets pretty intense here, and some of these examples here are a little more challenging. You know, we're further into the book now, right? So, you know, to make it this far, ideally you've studied quite a bit of advanced calculus. So let's pay special attention to this here. It says the series, so we have a series there and a series there, are called repeated series. And it says convergence of both repeated series does not imply their equality. And they give you a series here, f of m comma n, and they tell you these two statements. Okay, so we're gonna verify that this is true and that this is true. And then here it talks about an important case in which the two repeated series are equal. And it's described here in this theorem here. In this particular case, the repeated series are equal. But here's an example of where the repeated series are not equal. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna verify both of these statements. Notice there's no um, explanation here. So I'm just gonna do my best to explain this. All right, let's do it. Okay, let's go through all of this very carefully. So I'm gonna go ahead and write down f. So we have f of m comma n, and this is equal to the following piecewise function. So we say it's one if m is equal to n plus one. And this is true for n equals one, two, et cetera. So what this is saying is that if m is one greater than n, the result is one. Okay, that's really important to think about it that way. So then it's negative one if m is equal to n minus one. And so what this is saying is that f is equal to negative one when m is one less than n. So if m is exactly one higher than n, you get one. If it's exactly one less than n, you get negative one. Otherwise, it's going to be zero. So I think that's something that you want to play with before you actually try to prove the statements. And let's just, let's just mess around here. Like if I plug in f of three, two, what does this mean? So here, if you wanna use these equations, m is three, so you have three equals two plus one. You see, so it's this condition here, okay? So this is gonna be one. And notice m is exactly one higher. Whereas if we do f of two, three, that should give us negative one. And notice that two is equal to three minus one. Right, so you have this condition here. So this is your m, this is your n, this is your m, this is your n. So I think it's really, really important to think about it that way. And otherwise you're gonna get zero. So if you do something like this, you're gonna get zero. So when the first component is exactly one higher, so when m is exactly one higher than the second component, you get one. When the first component is exactly one lower, you get negative one. Otherwise you get zero. Okay, now that we have that out of the way, I'm just gonna write down the two things that are in the book. Let me just show you the book because I have it here. Let's see if I can pull it up so you can see it on the screen. So we're gonna show, uh, let's see, they're right here. These two equations here, this one here and this one here. So I'm gonna go ahead and write them down on the piece of paper. So we have them here. So the first one we want to show is this one. M equals one to infinity. And then we have the infinite sum N equals one to infinity of f of m comma n. And we have to show that this is equal to negative one, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna write it out, okay? This is equal to the infinite sum. And perhaps this is a naive approach, I don't know, but it works and you can reason it this way. So th the n is what's changing here in this first infinite series. So you plug in one, so your first term is gonna be f of m1. Your second one will be f of m2. And we know that all of these are gonna be zero, right? What really matters, okay, what really matters is the one, the case where m is exactly uh, one higher or one lower than its second component. 
So basically we can skip ahead. We care about this case here. We care about f of m, m minus one. The next one would be f of m, m, which is zero. And the next one would be f of m plus one, m, which is one. Well, we know that's one. Okay, so the issue is that this is actually still an infinite sum, right? We have, this is a sum from one to infinity of a sum. So it's an it's a infinite series of an infinite series. So it can get a little crazy. So to think about it really clearly, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna plug in values and see what happens. So let's just plug in one. If we were to plug in one here, let's just write down this infinite series for the value of m equals one. The first term would be f of one, one. The second one would be f of one, two, and then f of one, three, et cetera, right? Because um, you, you fixed m equals one, so then you just start counting up with the second term. We know that this is zero, right? And we know that all of these are zero. So the only one that matters is this one. So the first component is exactly one less. So this is gonna be negative one, okay? Then when m is two, in this case, we start at two. So we get f of two, one plus f of 2, 2, right, because we're increasing the second term, plus f of 2, 3, et cetera. Whoops, that's too many dots. You're supposed to use three dots. And so this one's zero. This one, this one is one higher. So this one's gonna be one. This one's gonna be zero. This one's gonna be negative one because it's one lower. And the rest of them are zero. So this is just zero. And the same thing you see is gonna happen when m equals three. When m is three, we get f of three, one, plus f of three, two, that's gonna be one, f of three, three, it's gonna be zero, plus f of three, four, it's gonna be negative one, f of three, five, it's gonna be zero. So this one is zero, this one is negative one, this one is zero, this one is one, negative one plus one is zero, the rest are zero, so you just get zero. So it turns out that the only time we're gonna get a non-zero number is when we plug in m equals one. Therefore, this repeated series is equal to negative one. Right? Just not really a proof, just going through it and just explaining it. Um, and Apostle doesn't really I mean, he just says it's true, right? So you can see the kind of, um, the kind of you know, effort it takes to get through these books. But I think they're still pretty cool because when you understand it on your own like this, I think it makes it cooler. All right, so let's go ahead and justify the second equation in Apostle's book. It's this one here. So as before, we're just basically going to write this out. So we have the infinite sum as n runs from one to infinity. And we just have to start by plugging in one here. So we'll get parentheses f of 1n plus, then you plug in two, so you get f of 2n plus, let's go ahead and write down this one, f of n minus one comma n. That's gonna be negative one, right? Because um, it's one less uh, than this one, right? The first component is one less than the second component, so you always get negative one. This one is zero, this one is one, Etc. The rest of them are zero. So now let's just go ahead and plug in n equals one here. So you can see, plugging in n equals one, the first term is going to be f of one one plus f of two one plus f of three one. It's really easy to get your m's and n's mixed up. So um, this is zero. This is one. This is zero. So this whole thing is just one, right? Because this is zero and this is zero. This is exactly one higher than this one, so you get one. Now let's do n equals two. So again, the, it's the second component that's always gonna be two here. So this is f of one, two, plus f of two, two, plus f of three, two, plus f of four, two, right? Second component's always two. And then what's happening here? This is negative one, this is zero, this is one, this is zero, so you get zero. It looks like the rest are gonna be zero, but let's just check, n equals three. So plugging in three, we get f of one comma three plus f of two comma three plus f of three comma three, f of four three, 
f of 5, 3, etc. This is 0, this is negative 1, this is 0, this is 1, this is 0, the rest are 0. So you get 0. So the only one that's really going to give you a non-zero number is the case where n equals 1. Therefore, this whole thing is equal to 1. So kind of cool, right? Really interesting example from this book by Tom Apostle. Yeah, pretty cool. So hopefully that made a little bit of sense. Anyways, this is a really interesting book. It's got all kinds of really fun math you can go through and sit down with a piece of paper and a pencil and just try to work through it. It's called Mathematical Analysis by Apostle. And I'll try to leave a link in the description. I'll look for it. I'm pretty sure this book is not as expensive as like his calculus book. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Good luck.